Adrian Ann Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, April 3rd, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for April 3rd, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in-person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Sprank, Here. Wethel, Here. City Manager Van Milligan, Here. and City Attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh. I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will move on to proclamations. Our first proclamation is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Okay, and I think Sarah McKenzie and Jenny Fitzgerald are here to accept this proclamation. Back in the corner there. You can come on up, and if you'd like to say a few words before I read the proclamation, you can feel free. Yes, if you would, please. And just a quick note for everybody. It moves up and down. There's a little switch on the right there. You can move it down if you want to. You can if you want, if you <laughs> want to be able to see our faces. And then um, the microphone, if you just speak right into it, that's helpful. Thank you. Perfect. So my name is Sarah McKenzie, and this is Jenny Fitzgerald. We're here from the Riverview Center. Um, we provide advo advocacy, counseling, and therapy serv services to survivors and secondary survivors of sexual violence. Um, and we are very appreciative and um, for you allowing us to be here today. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah and Jenny, for being here to accept this proclamation. City Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas sexual assault affects women, children, and men of all racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds, and whereas in addition to the immediate physical and emotional costs, sexual assault may also have associated consequences of post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, depression, homelessness, eating disorders, and suicide. And whereas sexual assault can be devastating not only to the survivor, but also for the family, friends, and community of the survivor. And whereas, since no one person, organization, agency, or community can eliminate sexual assault on their own, we must work together to educate our entire population about what can be done to prevent sexual assault, support survivors and their significant others, and support those agencies providing services to survivors. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2023 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and encourage all residents to learn more about preventing sexual violence. Our Adrian. second proclamation is Junior Achievement Day. Okay, Scott Ellerbeck is here, I believe. <clears throat> Find the right switch here. There we go. There you go. Uh, my name is Scott Ellerbeck. I'm the Senior Vice President for Community Relations at Junior Achievement of the Heartland. Uh, what we do is three things. We teach kids about making good money decisions, so financial literacy, we talk to kids a lot about career and work readiness, 
and what does that look like when you hit the workforce after high school? Uh, we talk a lot about entrepreneurship, so running businesses, business acumen, what does that look like from the ground floor up? So this school year, we'll reach about 4,500 kids, grades kindergarten through high school with our programming. Uh, we're super excited to say that we impacted every kid in kindergarten, second grade, and fifth grade throughout the Dubuque Community School District. As we move into next school year, every student in kindergarten through fifth grade will get JA programming. And that doesn't just happen. Uh, we work with a ton of community and business volunteers uh, to go into classrooms and share their stories, really light that fire and passion with youth. And it's amazing what, uh, what our work does locally here throughout Dubuque. I just, uh, just finished up a fifth grade class uh, last week. It was actually my daughter's uh, school out of Carver. And the things that we were talking about um, were, were terms such as um, <clears throat> uh, innovation, technology, uh, high growth, high demand jobs, and what does that look like to a fifth grader? Some of, the, some of the answers to questions that we talked through in a fifth grade classroom were just amazing. These students and their families, um, the ones especially that have businesses of their own, and what they're teaching their kids um, throughout that process is amazing. And we're just grateful that uh, we can supplement what teachers do in the classroom with our programs as well. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Scott. Thanks for sharing all that and for all the work that you guys do at JA. And uh, thanks for being here to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the City of Dubuque will observe Junior Achievement Day on April 6, 2023 as an opportunity to recognize and celebrate Junior Achievement of the Heartland for empowering our young people to own their economic success. And whereas Junior Achievement of the Heartland's educational contribution equips our young people to become the next generation of productive employees and self-sufficient citizens to ensure the economic prosperity of Dubuque. And whereas it is fitting for parents, educators, businesses, and other members of the community to join in Junior Achievement's effort to ensure the future success and economic health of our young people and the communities in which they live. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the sixth day of April 2023 as Junior Achievement Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Our third proclamation is Community Development Week. Okay, Teresa Caldwell is here with us today. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Teresa Caldwell. I have a mint in my mouth, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm the Executive Director at the Dubuque Food Pantry, and my address is 1633 Elm Street. The Dubuque Food Pantry is honored to have been awarded CDBG CARES funding. The $167,955 was used toward the purchase of our new location at 1310 White Street. The new location has twice the square footage to serve our shoppers in need in our community. We now have the capacity to have a choice shopping experience for our shoppers. Since COVID, we were not able to let shoppers in the door. There was limited space for us as staff and volunteers to be in the building. The new location has allowed us to have everything on one level. Both staff and shoppers are happy to have the new Dubuque Food Pantry. In the past two years, we added a delivery on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of each month to seniors, um, mobility challenged, and low-income families at 12 different facilities. We served 206 orders in February in this particular delivery program in February alone. So, each month is increasing. We also serve over 13,000 families on a yearly basis. The CDBG dollars 
has allowed us to have the steady and sustainable growth that we needed. We look forward to the additional growth we need um, and we keep experiencing that with the help of our community. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. The D CDBG funds make a difference every day in the lives of our community members. Thank you. Well, thank you, Teresa, for all the work that you continue to do, and thank you. thank you very much for being here to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque proclamation. Whereas the week of April 10th to the 14th, 2023, has been designated as National Community Development Week to celebrate the Community Development Block Grant Program. And whereas the CDBG program provides annual funding and flexibility to local communities to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing, a suitable living environment, and economic opportunities to low and moderate income residents. And whereas over the past three years, our community has received a total of $4,218,119 in CDBG and CDBG CV funds. And whereas the following activities have been funded, first time home buyer program, homeowner rehabilitation program, rental unit rehabilitation, lead and healthy homes match funding, short term rental, mortgage and utility assistance, micro enterprise assistance program, infrastructure improvements, neighborhood recreation programs, nonprofit support grants, homeless shelter rehabilitation, zoning enforcement, vacant building enforcement, and activities to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the week of April 10th to the 14th, 2023, as Community Development Week in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Our fourth proclamation is Dubuque YP Days of Caring. I believe I'm inviting Nick Rossman back up to the podium. Didn't quite get enough in his work session, so he's back for more. Yeah, I'm just doing double duty here. So. <laughs> uh, no, uh, this is my, I think, second year on the, the board for the Days of Caring. Um, so I think we had uh, about 1,200 uh, volunteers last year for on 35 or 40 service projects, and I think we've got another 30 or so lined up for this year, and uh, most of the spots, I believe, are filled up by April 28th, and I know um, you all did a service project last year, and I didn't do my homework to see if you all signed up again this year, but <laughs> we, we don't have to talk about that, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know what else I have to say. Well, it's such a great event, and I know we, we did enjoy it last year for sure. It was uh, very tiring for all the right reasons. So thank you very much, Nick. We really appreciate you being here to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque proclamation. Whereas Dubuque is a city known for its spirit of volunteerism and community pride, and whereas Young Professionals of Dubuque is an organization in Dubuque committed to making the city a wonderful place to live, work, and play. And whereas Dubuque YP Days of Caring is a community event where more than 1,100 volunteers conduct projects at nonprofits throughout the city. And whereas Dubuque YP Days of Caring benefits not only those nonprofits, but the entire city of Dubuque. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 28th day of April, 2023, as Dubuque YP Days of Caring in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Our final proclamation is Clark University women's basketball team 2023 NAIA national champions. Well, I would invite uh, Coach Courtney Boyd and the champions with us today. And I see we've got some super fans in the audience too. Nice to see you again, Mary Rose. Yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to say a few words, Coach, we'd. I don't think there I can you go. see you. You found it. Yeah. Excellent. I got to lower it. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us and just the opportunity um, to share our excitedness about what just happened. I have Emma Kelchin from Bellevue, uh, current nursing graduate and uh, going for her MBA at Clark, and Athena Eubel from Shiacton, Wisconsin, with her athletic training degree, also going for her master's in business. So uh, two very well um, 
decorated student athletes for Clark and for us to be able to allow them to not only study something that they love but also play the game that they've had a lot of passion for in the last 15 or so years. Uh, to be able to do both at Clark has really been a blessing for them and for us to bring home uh, success and to be able to recognize them as a group. Uh, no better group, in my humble opinion, to be able to be recognized at, at uh, something like this. And so I just appreciate them being able to be with me tonight and you guys taking a few minutes to congratulate them. So thank you for having us. Yeah. Well, Emma, Athena, and Coach, thank you very much for being here to accept this proclamation. We're, we're very excited. Oh. Sorry, I'm Courtney Boyd. <laughs> yes, that's OK. Yes. <laughs> it's good to meet you. Thank you very much for being here. City Dubuque Proclamation, whereas Clark University's women's basketball won the 2023 National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, NAIA, National Championship, and whereas that championship earned Clark University and the Dubuque community their first college basketball championship ever, and whereas the championship was won at the conclusion of a six-game run within a 64-team field where the Pride defeated the defending NAIA champions by a final score of 63-52, to on March 18th, and whereas at the conclusion of the championship, Clark finished with a program best 33 and four record, leading to head coach Courtney Boyd being named the NAIA National Coach of the Year. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby recognize the Clark University women's basketball team as the 2023 NAIA National Champions. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks for being here. Well, that's all the fun stuff, everybody. So we'll get to work now. We'll move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration, and consent items can be found on pages two through five of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have anyone in chambers who would like to remove any of the consent items for separate discussion this evening? Seeing no one, do we have any virtual requests? We do not. Okay. No input received. All right. Take it back to the table then. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. And a motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber. Aye. Uh, yes. Res <laughs> Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have three. First is proceedings to set public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $5,800,000 general obligation bonds series 2023 for April 17th, 2023. Second is set public hearing for sale of city owned property at 2407 Queen Street for April 17th, 2023. And third is resolution of necessity for the proposed amended and restated urban renewal plan for the greater downtown urban renewal district version 2023.2 for May 1st, 2023. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions and set the public hearings for the dates specified. Second by Wethel. A motion by Roussel, a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll please? Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have applicant review for the Equity and Human Rights Commission and the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission. Okay. So we have quite a few names here. So I'm going to read through every single one, see if anyone has any um, comments on any of these. But we first have the Equity and Human Rights Commission. Um, that looks like there are three three-year terms that run through January of 26 and then one three-year term that runs through January of 24. Our first applicant is Pamela Birch. Do we have anyone to address us on this applicant's, or on this applicant, I mean? Okay, 
Anyone virtually? No. Okay. And no one but received. Thank you. And then Jake Kerchak is our next applicant. Any virtual? No. No one but received. Okay. Um, Kristen Leffler. Anyone here to address us on this applicant? Virtually? No. No input received. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lauren Link. I see no one here. No. Virtual? No input. All right. Uh, Candace Raymond. No. No input received. Thank you. Um, Enoch Sanchez. Uh, Equity and Human Rights Commission Chairperson Carla Anderson of 1131 Main Street Apartment 1 submitted input in support of Enoch Sanchez's application, and that's been included with the um, applicant review agenda item. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, Teresa Sampson-Brown. No. Right. No input. Thank you. And Nina Strausslin. Okay. No input. Over there. All right. I'll move on then to the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission, uh, one three-year term through June 30th, 2025, and there are two applicants. The first is Shirley Snow. Do have anyone to address us on this application? Oh, sorry. Okay. We'll look left no, first, I'm then right. Yeah. Okay, sorry. There we go. Um, and Jason Hinkle is our final applicant for the evening. No. Okay. So no input there. With that, we can move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is submission of the annual Public Housing Agency PHA plan, Federal Fiscal Year 2023, PHA Fiscal Year 2024 annual plan. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I uh, move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Roussel. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approve to submit the Federal Fiscal Year 2023 Annual PHA Plan or Public Housing Agency Plan along with a certification for consistency with the consolidated plan. Each year the City of Dubuque is required to submit a Public Housing Agency Plan. The PHA Plan is a comprehensive guide to the policies, programs, operations, and strategies for meeting local housing needs and goals. There are two parts to the PHA plan, the five-year plan, which was submitted in fiscal year 2020, and the annual plan, which is submitted this year. Part of the submission includes a certification by state or local office of PHA consistency with the consolidated plan. The PHA plan and certifications follow housing and urban development approved templates and must be submitted accordingly. Any local, regional, or state agency that receives funds to operate federal Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Programs must submit a PHA plan. To ensure public participation in the process, PHA plans must be available for inspection by the public both during the public review period prior to the board hearing and submission to HUD. Public notice was published 45 days in advance of this public hearing. The Housing Commission voted to approve the PHA plan on Tuesday, January 31st, 2023. The PHA Resident Advisory Board also reviewed the PHA plan on February 6, 2023, and all comments and minutes from their meeting is included in the plan. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider City Council approval to submit the Federal Fiscal Year 2023 Annual PHA Plan along with the certificate, I'm sorry, the certification of consistency with the consolidated plan. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? How do you mean? Hey, there we go. Just a reminder for name and address, please, when you're yeah. there. Good evening, Anthony Allen. Uh, I represent the NAACP as its president. I just want to uh, speak to a couple of things uh, as to 
our national organization's uh, resolutions in regards to housing. Uh, but first, uh, good evening to all of you, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, City Managers, City Clerk, as well as the City Attorney. So thank you for allowing us to uh, speak to this. Uh, as a country, the housing problems uh, continue to impact minority communities severely. It is incumbent that the NAACP reaffirm, reaffirm its commitment uh, to address and remedy housing discrimination and inequities and advocate equal opportunity and access to adequate affordable housing. Uh, some of the major concerns continuing to, to exist for many years uh, are the lack of adequate and affordable housing and the inaction of all levels of government uh, to address these concerns. The growing shortage of good public housing for the economically disadvantaged, the decreasing uh, availability and sometimes questionable uh, distribution of housing assistance vouchers, uh, the continuous growth of the homeless persons and families in most cities and other communities, the real and perceived discrimination, including racial profiling, uh, and some programs already in effect, are housing discrimination based on solely race, income, gender, the number of family members and housing subsidy, subsidies, and because affirmative uh, marketing is not adequately promoted and economically disadvantaged, people continue to face drastic cuts in funding. I'm sorry for reading to you. I'm used to just talking out loud, so if I you know, stumble, I apologize for that. Uh, the Dubuque branch, uh, we reaffirm our commitment. Uh, two years ago, I believe, we came before you uh, in regards to a work study, and we talked about our housing initiatives. Uh, in 2016, we talked about our housing initiatives. Uh, in the past, we've worked with the Source of Income Analysis Committee uh, in regards to trying to get that passed, but the state took over and that's no longer available. Uh, but there are still people struggling within our community in regards to housing. Uh, I believe about 10 years ago, uh, there was uh, points put to a system in regards to how we honor our housing recipients. Uh, that was looked up on as uh, not good in HUD's eyes. Uh, I don't want to go back that route. Uh, I would like us to continue to push forward. So we at the NAACP, we always collaborate and work toward uh, solutions, uh, and we're continuing to do that. So uh, with that said, uh, we would like the collaboration efforts to continue. Anything we can do to assist in making sure our residents receive affordable and fair, uh, safe housing. Uh, with that being said, R.S. Stewart, I think, is going to join, and she has something to speak to it. So if there's questions that you may have, uh, feel free to ask after she speaks to the issue. Thank you, Anthony, right. for your yes. comments. Uh, R.R.S. Stewart, Treasurer of Dubuque Branch, NAACP. Uh, my addresses are 460 Summit Street and 741 West 3rd Street. The reason for two addresses is because uh, the second property is owned by my parents. Uh, they are landlords and I'm the agent for them. So I'm not just speaking to you as a member of the NAACP, I'm also speaking to you as a landlord's agent. Um, and I'm speaking to you to raise concerns uh, with the annual plan you're talking about tonight, and also with actions that you took last month, specifically with saying that you want to reinstitute a plan offering preference points for housing choice vouchers to local references. I appreciate that Councilmember Resnick voted against this plan, and all of you should have voted against this plan because HUD found the plan to be discriminatory 10 years ago and withheld millions of dollars of funding from the city of Dubuque in 2012 because you approved a plan that gave preference points to people who were residents of the city of Dubuque because they found that to be basically a synonym for race and basically a way to say we're gonna give more vouchers to white people than people of color. So if you don't want the city of Dubuque to be called racist, don't do things that HUD has said were racist in the past. 
So that is our issue with the housing plan that you're talking about approving tonight. I'm sorry to be blunt, but HUD dinged you on this 10 years ago. So why are you even considering doing it again? I know you want to get more landlords to accept housing choice vouchers, but I don't think the way to do it is to go down the path of approving a plan that HUD already told you is illegal. Thank you. Thank you, RRS, for your comments. Thank you. My name is Tom Lujutis. I live at 786 Stone Ridge Place, and I would like to speak for myself on a related topic. I know that the, that the plan that you submitted uh, is essentially the plan that was done several years ago, I recognize this as an annual plan. I have previously made points about this as part of NAACP, that we think that you need smart, measurable objectives in that plan rather than the goals that I have found from year to year. But I want to speak to another area of housing that I think is important. Uh, it is difficult, if not impossible, to find housing in this community for low-income people that need housing that is well-maintained, housing where your responsibility for payment is the rent payment, plus your uh, electric utilities, other utilities are covered. Uh, also, it's difficult in this community to find housing that is well maintained at low rates, and also that uh, there are regular inspections that come from, from HUD as well as our own local people. And I know that our own local people do an ever better job, and I appreciate uh, housing being responsive to us and talking with us on a regular basis. Uh, what I'm talking about is housing that uh, my son lives in. He lives in Portland, Oregon. It's section 42 housing. Uh, the people that live there make under $28,000. Uh, it's a downtown building. The funding for Section 42 is for downtown buildings. And uh, that housing uh, in Portland, Oregon, we pay $400 a month. Portland, Oregon is a very high-cost city. Uh, we're talking about housing that if you take the initiative on this would put housing in the area that the Dubuque Rescue Mission talks about. Many of those people that are homeless uh, are unable to afford the kind of rents that are in our community. Section 42 at $400 a month for, uh, for uh, a small apartment would probably mean housing in this community at $300 a month and would resolve some of the, the housing problems that we have, particularly for the homeless and low income. These facilities are often built as the St. Francis where my son lives, where there are also uh, more than studio apartments. You pay $400 for a studio apartment there are also within that building two bedroom apartments with a living room, et cetera, that go at, at the competitive rates that are a part of Portland. If we have this kind of housing in our community, it would mean that there would be also uh, higher end apartments within that. Uh, what that means for the people that develop these is they get a considerable tax break and they also are able to, uh, to provide a good facility and to also make money in the endeavor. It seems like everyone wins. Uh, and so while this is not directly a part of the, the HUD proposal that you're looking at, I would hope that you as a council 
would either take action to begin exploring with realtor developers uh, having Section 42 housing in this community. Uh, I know that this kind of thing can happen, that we can provide better housing. Uh, the work that all of you have done and housing have done with the garden apartments near Roosevelt School are an example of how better low-income housing can be achieved. I would urge you to all cons also consider uh, Act 42 housing as well. And if I may, I will take my notes that I used and walk them to the mayor with your permission. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any others this evening on this particular public hearing? Do we have any virtual? No virtual. Input. Okay. And no input received. Okay. Nobody else? Okay. Back to the table then for discussion. Um, I, I'd actually like to kick off the, the discussion if, if everybody doesn't mind. Um, Mike, I have a couple of questions, and, and I apologize for not asking this one earlier to be able to give staff time to do it, so you might not have the answer, and, and I'll understand if you don't. But I was thinking, um, as I was looking through this item and getting ready for this meeting, we've approved a number of units, um, uh, development agreements with several different developers in the last year. And I was curious how many units total we've approved, and then how many we would, those we would have that would be a uh, be considered affordable housing or will be accepting vouchers because of the fact that they've gone through a development agreement with the city. I have no idea if you have that answer off the top of your head. And um, I'm just curious, we've got a you know round estimate of where we might be on that. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Alexis Steger, the Housing and Community Development Department Director is under the weather, so she's not here with us in person, but she is here online. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask her to try and address the issues that have been brought up. Sure. Yeah. Sorry to hear you're not feeling well, Alexis. If, if you're there, we'd, um, and if you have any of that answer, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Alexis Seger, Housing and Community Development Director. Um, so last year, we got up and running the two developments out on Radford Road. One is a family, um, and that's about 50 <coughs> units. And then we had the senior behind it, um, and that was just about 60, so it was 110 units that went online with those agreements, and they do accept housing choice vouchers. They are both low-income housing tax credit um, developments as well. So even though they may not um, accept or may not have vouchers in every unit, they're also um, low-income rents. So that's 110 just from last year. We have several that are under uh, under works and that we're working through, and those would be um, required to accept housing choice vouchers as well if we have any support. So um, we've got the ones obviously going up um, behind Blaine's Farm and Fleet, and um, those would all be accepting housing choice vouchers as well, and that would be another 390 when they're completed. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, I, I know that, you know, we've, um, and first of all, let me let me say out loud, I, I really appreciate you showing up uh, from the community, um, Anthony RRS and Tom and everybody with you tonight to be able to discuss this. You know, this is a frequent discussion. You're frequent members of the discussion, and I appreciate you being, um, being at the table and vocal about this on a regular basis. It's a really important discussion that we're having. Um, with that said, we, we, we have done some things to try to address this. I know we've, we've been trying in certain ways. Um, you know, Anthony pointed out the fact that the state of Iowa took our ability away to be able to um, address the, the source of income and require housing choice vouchers be accepted by landlords. So um, as a part of that, and some of the ways that we've dealt with that over time is we, when we do development agreements, we, we put in there that we require landlords to be able to accept housing choice vouchers. And these developments in particular are some that I've noticed. And, and I know that this does apply to, to what we're talking about tonight because you know the goals that are described in here are the, the very same goals that you're talking about um, in the PHA plan, I should say. So um, another question that I have it has to do with um, it, it, RS uh, um, and the comments that she made regarding the uh, 
uh, preference points, which was a very long discussion here when we had it um, in the council chambers for the very reasons that you pointed out. Um, there was not, um, we, we voted for this, but at the same time there was trepidation in, in moving forward uh, based on what had happened in the past. So Mike um, or Alexis, I guess, I'm curious if we have any updates in our interactions with uh, housing and urban development, because I know that we've spoken to them and that was part of the goal is to try to figure out how we can move forward in this and do it in a way that doesn't um, create any sort of disparate impact for any, any groups. Um, are there any updates you could provide for us on that? Alexis, can you provide an update on our discussions with HUD, please? Yes, Alexis Sager, so Housing Community Development Director. Uh, so we had a conversation with HUD, the um, Fair Housing Office, and the uh, Field Office, and then also on that call were two of HUD's lawyers. Um, they did discuss the residency preference with us. Um, they There were a couple ways that they wanted to make sure we weren't making it a residency requirement. Um, and then one of the HUD lawyers agreed to look at the data that we were going to be providing to uh, be looking at monthly for disparate impact. So um, they did offer some of that. And then um, HUD did re reach out to us yesterday to offer some technical assistance as well. So they're um, gonna be providing eight hours of technical assistance on any topic we should choose. So this will be one of those topics that we will also get more assistance on. Um, so we are currently, <clears throat> Right now, HUD didn't say yes, they didn't say no. Um, that's kind of how HUD does that. They um, can't say they'd never come and pursue it, um, but they are giving us some recommendations. So we're working through those recommendations now. We have um, not implemented the residency preference points. The last two months we've accepted 150 applicants one month and then all applicants to our wait list last month. So we did not need a residency preference point in those. Um, so we have not used it yet, and we are going to um, wait and see how many applications come in for the next couple of months before that is implemented. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, because I know in our discussion that we had about this when we when we uh, put that forward, it was there. First of all, the way that it's written now and the the way that you've proposed it is very different than it was in the past. Um, but then also we, we were hoping that we could get some direction from HUD to, to try to do this as best as possible uh, because I know that the reasons for doing it are so we don't lose our vouchers. That's the whole reason that we're trying to move forward with this. Um, all right, so with that, I'll open the floor to the rest of my council colleagues for some discussion here. I may have more questions as we go on. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. So um, <clears throat> Ms. Steger confirmed that HUD has not approved this uh, and um, let alone in writing. And I was just wondering what level uh, they were talking to. Was that the regional level or the, the national level of HUD? It, it doesn't really matter if we don't get assigned approval. I guess it doesn't matter what level uh, we've been working with so far. I appreciate the efforts, uh, but knowing um, what we know now, I'm wondering if there is council uh, reconsideration the, for the preference points to city residents it's found on page uh, six of ten of the um, of our um, in our in our packet. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Yep, in in our agenda in the um, so in the streamlined annual PHA plan it's on page six of ten. It's sub goal bullet number three, and um, I, I think we really ought to seriously consider. As the mayor mentioned, we talked and there was trepidation, and we said, let's see what we can do to get approval from HUD. You know, and it hasn't, hasn't happened. So um, I think that really should not only give us pause, but uh, pause, uh, but it should cause us to put the brakes on that. And um, here we have wonderful community fair housing supporters, and they're advocating for the removal of this provision. Uh, it's still a, a great plan. Uh, there's so many great things, so I, I don't wish to uh, vote against the whole plan, but I can't vote for this plan with this provision. But I'm hoping that other city council members, uh, knowing what we heard tonight and what we heard uh, from Ms. Steger about not getting approval from HUD yet, uh, that it's uh, let's move forward with this great plan. And I, and I hope that uh, some others might talk about 
um, the reconsideration and amending this plan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Wethel. Uh, I'd like to also thank everybody who came in tonight. Um, I had a really thought-provoking email from a constituent last week, which made me also dig deeper into um, the idea of the actual wording was, whereas a preference point will be added to an applicant's application if they are currently a city of Dubuque resident. And um, what was pointed out to me by this constituent was that people wanna come to our city to have a better life. People wanna come to Dubuque because we've got a great city. People want a good education for their kids. They want a place that is safe to raise them. They want a place where they can have a good job and Lord knows we've got lots of jobs. And so when I look at people who are disadvantaged, looking for a better life for their family, an email I received last week really made me take pause and think about this and read a little deeper. Um, and thank you for your comments this evening as well. I am a little uncomfortable with where this lies right now and the wording of it simply because of those reasons. Um, I think with time and input from my constituents, it's made me go to a different place in the way I feel about this. So I'm gonna jump back in. I, I wanna make something abundantly clear. There is nothing about what we have voted on here that has said we don't want people to move to Dubuque, period. There's nothing about that, regardless of who anyone is. I think this council has said time and time again that we wanna welcome everyone and anyone to the city of Dubuque if they want to be a Dubuquer, plain and simple. And we've worked to do that. So I wanna make sure that as we have this conversation, we're not having this conversation around parameters of we're either welcoming people to Dubuque or we're not because that was not my interpretation of what this, what this was as we talked about it. Um, when we talked about preference points, and it was a very careful and deliberate conversation that lasted a while while we were here, when we did it, we did it for a very specific reason, because we are at danger of losing the vouchers that we currently have, and we are at danger of furthering the housing problem that we have if we don't allow people to get into the, the places where they, they need to live. So I, I, wanna, I wanna make sure that as we talk about this, that, that that point is really clear because I think that this could easily get convoluted into a place where um, we or anyone is accused of not being welcoming. Um, and and that's, I, I don't think the case here. I, you know, I, I think that um, the Housing and Community Development Department has done a very careful job of trying to craft this plan that we're looking at right now and the pieces of it to try and solve the housing problems that we currently have. So just, I just wanna make that clear as we talk about it. Um, Ms. Farber, go ahead. I just wanna to add to that and also I wanna thank everybody that spoke tonight. Um, just wanna make it clear on the low housing, um, I'm sorry, for the low income folks that there is um, opportunity for funding for utilities if indeed uh, they fill out applications for that if their incomes meet a certain or are below a certain threshold. So I just wanted to mention that first. Um, and then I have a question for um, Alexis regarding the fair housing goal and this document. If we do not accept and move this document forward, what does that do for the status of our relationship with HUD and all of the voucher systems that we currently have within the city of Dubuque? Uh, Alexis Stegger, Housing Community Development Director. So tonight, uh, the council would need to approve a version of the plan. They can amend the plan um, if more comfortable going forward, striking that or, or amending that section. Um, but if the council does not approve that plan tonight, we would not be in compliance with um, submitting our annual plan on time just based on city council meeting timelines. So um, some version of the plan does need to go forward tonight if city council wants to amend or strike that section they can do so and still approve the rest of the plan. Okay, just a follow-up question. Would that striking that put us in jeopardy for the HUD vouchers overall? So completely striking it would mean that we'd have to go back and am amend the admin plan that you approved in February. Um, so we'd have to amend that right away because you aren't including anything about res residential preference 
preference points in this plan. Um, so we would have to go back and amend again the admin plan. Um, if you wanted to strike it, that's no big deal. We'll bring it back to the council amended. Um, but the, if you wanted to just say we'll explore residency preference points with that with that bullet point, that still allows us to continue to bring this back to council and have these conversations. Okay. And then I do think I recall that one of the reasons we had this discussion was because some of these uh, recipients of the HUD vouchers were leaving Dubuque and then the program that we were monitoring and paying for had to go with them. And I do recall that that was of concern that once if somebody left Dubuque and went to another city, the, the HUD voucher program went with them and then we would be accountable for that voucher um, management, if I get that correct um, on that, Lexis. And then there was some follow-up to that regarding what our funding could or could not be based on that. Could you just refresh our memories on that? Uh, yeah, so those are called poured out vouchers. So you can take your voucher to any um, other location that is a public housing authority once you've lived in the city of Dubuque for 12 months. Um, if you are already a resident, you can take that voucher right away if you've lived here for 12 months prior to receiving your voucher. Um, but when they take the voucher to another authority, uh, we as a city of Dubuque pay our federal funds to that voucher, no matter where that is in the United States, until that public housing authority decides to take it under their budget. Sometimes they'll take it right away. Um, we have a voucher that's been out for 20 years that we've been paying in Seattle. So it can just depend on how that works. Um, it also, we don't get to decide, the other public housing authority does. And so what we see is at the end of our budget year, other public housing authorities will absorb that to make their budget. And that makes it so we can't make ours because it takes two to three months um, and one more than one voucher to replace that budget in the city of Dubuque, just because cost of living in other big cities is much higher. So um, when we lose one voucher to that, we have to lease up two in the city of Dubuque to make up that budget. So what it does is it ultimately continues to decrease our budget. Um, if we can find a way to lease people up faster, um, if they're living here in place, that would help that budget issue. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mike. I'd just like to elaborate on some of the things Alexis said. And Alexis, if I'm way off base on any of my explanation or numbers, please correct me. Um, but we are authorized for over 1,100 Section 8 vouchers, but we're only funded for somewhere around 800. And it's a combination of reasons. Um, for a long time, HUD didn't fund all of our vouchers, but also on an annual basis, if we don't use our vouchers, they don't fund them. And so then the next year we have less funded vouchers. And so um, the idea behind the local preference was that we have a lot of people who are low income today who live in Dubuque, who live in an apartment that they can't afford, but they don't get any Section 8 assistance. And they already have a relationship with the landlord. So when we have people that we give a new voucher to and they can't find a unit, then the voucher doesn't get used. And we know part of the problem is we don't have enough units available and enough landlords participating in the program to provide those units. We also know we're restricted by state law to in any way force a landlord to do that. And so our hope is that we do come up with a, a way through HUD to offer preference points, or I'm sorry, offer local preference. We know other places do it. As a matter of fact, fact HUD has provided us the names of other cities that do it. So HUD knows other places do it. And uh, the idea being some of these people who are living in a unit today, but are low income, but are not receiving assistance, would be able to convince their landlord, hey, I can get a voucher, you know me, you have a relationship with me, you like me as a tenant, I like you as a landlord, maybe generally you don't accept vouchers, but would you accept mine? And we think they will. And so we think we'll get people that are low income, that can't afford where they're living, financial assistance. And those people are gonna be white, they're gonna be black, they're gonna be women, they're gonna be men, they're gonna be elderly, they're gonna be young. We're not discriminating against anyone. It's just a way to not let our financial assistance never show up. For instance, 
we were at risk of losing a million dollars this last year because of our, our, the people who we had issued vouchers for, their inability to find a unit. And thank goodness HUD gave us a grace period, which I don't know how long it is, maybe it's a year, to retain that million dollars to continue to try and improve our program so that we can use the money. We just don't want the money going back to the federal government. We want people that need it to get it and have a better chance to succeed financially in their lives. And so Alexis, please correct me if I'm wrong on any of that. Alexis Duggar, all of that is correct, Mike. And Mr. Mayor, may I also yeah, chime China, in ahead. for a moment? Uh, Connor Bromwell, city attorney. Everybody else is doing it, right? Um, I want, to, I want to read you a piece from the Code of Federal Regulations related to uh, this program. So it's 24 CFR 960.206. So this comes right from the federal code. Residency requirements are prohibited. Uh, a public housing authority is not prohibited from adopting a residency preference. The public housing authority may only adopt or implement residency preferences in accordance with non-discrimination and equal opportunity requirements, and it references another title of the code for cross-reference. And it goes through a whole host of items that includes that a residency preference, for example, can't be based on how long an applicant has resided or worked in a residency preference area. Um, applicants who are working in an area or have been notified they are hired to work in a residency uh, preference area must be treated as residents of the residency preference area when you set it up geographically. So there are parameters um, outlined and they're uh, in this specific federal regulation. And um, as, as discussed when this last came up and we talked about the standard deviations in the math, which I don't understand because I'm not a math person, but I understand that it is um, mathematically and statistically significant. Um, those, the standard deviations in the formula that they put together, that came out of um, case law where that had been vetted. So again, these two things are kind of being used together, but we're still continuing to vet that further with HUD to make sure that we are within the bounds of all of those things. So that if it does come back to you after discussion with them to implement something, you, you would have all of that information. Thank you, Krenna. It's very helpful. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. It, it's quite a high wire act, balancing the needs of the people and the regulation of government and the duties of a council when we're trying to do the most basic things of housing and feeding people and trying to get it right. Uh, I stand by my vote in February to, to approve the, the administrative plan that included the, the residential preference because there are people that have applied for years for housing assistance that have, haven't managed to achieve it. Have, they've fallen off the list, they've timed out, they've had to come back and reapply, and I've got some serious sympathy for them. Um, I can see the budget shrinking every year, coming, what's coming from the feds because of uh, vouchers porting out, because of vouchers expiring when people can't find um, residency. Our challenges are, are in a multiple set of arenas, um, we don't have enough housing, working on that. Um, we, we have more than we had a year ago. We had more than we had 10 years ago. We don't have uh, enough landlords participating in the program. My goal has always been to make the program attractive enough to landlords that they want to be in it. And the scenario that Mike described, where the, the person who's leased up and it has a good, rep good uh, relationship with their landlord and then becomes available for a voucher, might just open that door a little bit, might create a relationship where a landlord suddenly realizes that it's not a bad deal, that it's certain money that's coming in and that uh, their tenant and they are better off for being in the program. So hopefully that happens. Um, now the, the consent decree that occurred in, in uh, the 2010s, you have to look at the sum total of it. It wasn't about residency, it was about a lot of things. It was about perception and we're, we're better for it. We've, we've been to educational sessions every single year, um, learning about fair housing, learning the intricacies of it, learning the harm of it, um, learning the realities of, of growing up not white in America and trying to get a roof over your head 
and uh, we're, we're a better city for it. We're a better city council for it. We've got a better housing department for it. Um, there's been a lot of very serious hard work on making this right. And I think that the preference points make it a little bit more right, make it a little bit more fair, and certainly protect the dollars that we have to have to administer the program in the first place. If, the, if there's no money there, um, then it's all on us. And what do we not do to do that um, with more city dollars? So I think it was the right choice. Um, it was not done in the dark. It was done if, with conversation after conversation after conversation with HUD, with a chain of, uh, of email messages, uh, some of which went unanswered from HUD, um, with uh, most of HUD out of the office and either not able or willing to respond sometimes. Um, but the responses that we have had were positive. The code says it's a, it's a reasonable thing to do. And I think it just protects the, our whole system to provide that uh, person who's lived in Dubuque for a while trying to get housing assistance just a little bit more of a leg up on the possibility of them being successful at it. It doesn't preclude others from applying. It doesn't preclude others from succeeding, as you heard Alexis say. And... Uh, the biggest challenge is just not enough places, not enough willing landlords, not enough uh, um, housing units. And we're moving the, ball, moving the needle on that. It's, it's a slow process, slower than I wish. Um, but I think we're getting there. And if we don't protect the integrity of the program, we won't be there. So that's, that's my thought on it. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Sprank. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, first for Alexis, uh, if we redo this process, what, every year? Or is it every two years? Alexis Steger, every year. Okay, so theoretically, if this doesn't work, we can take it out next year, because we'll have the data that will show if it worked or if it didn't work. Alexis Steger again, that would be correct. We would have uh, more data if we get to that point where we can implement the residency preference point, yes. Thank you. And then I have a question for our city manager. Um, <clears throat> overall, the, f the numbers related to the housing choice vouchers, those are sort of tied to our, and I always mispronounce the acronym, the CDBG funds, aren't they, to some extent? Uh, the no uh, Mike Van Milligan, city manager. Um, no, the number of vouchers are not tied to community development block grant. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a separate program. Right. I just kind of thought they were. Thank you. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. Um, I always like to listen to the input of all of my colleagues and the city manager and the helpful information from our city attorney. And um, for me, the most important thing is the fact that we are not able to lease up for the people the people in need. And that means that our funds for everyone who needs to use the program and who's currently using the program, they are at risk. And so knowing that Alexis is working carefully with HUD, that they're going to provide us with technical assistance, that they're, uh, we're going to monitor this monthly, um, I think that we should move ahead with this approach to help make sure that the people in our community can, can use the vouchers to, to find housing that they can afford that, that fits into their, to their budget. And um, if, as Mr. Sprank referred to, when we look at this again next year and we have the, the statistics that show us whether this works or, or doesn't work and we will have additional conversations with HUD, um, I think that this is the approach that we should take. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wethel. Just a couple more additional questions um, for you, Alexis. Um, and I hopefully, I submitted a little of this earlier, so hopefully um, it's not too hard to answer. Um, I know you mentioned, so other cities are currently using this preference point. Um, could you provide just a, a few of those cities, kind of, are they similar in size to us or? Uh, Alexis, so your housing community development director. Um, so we had uh, Cedar Rapids. We've got um, the Northwest Iowa PHA. A lot of PHAs cover more area than we do. They have eight counties they cover, but in those eight counties, this is pretty equivalent to the number of vouchers we have. Um, they are also providing it. 
Um, we dug in with a few of them, like Cedar Rapids and those that are just similar to us um, and kind of the area served. And um, Cedar Rapids is using the residence preference point, has been since we were in the t uh, 2010s. And uh, they also do an in-person requirement for their application, which we do not do. Um, so they're doing not only residency preference, but um, also kind of make it more difficult for people to apply from outside their city. Um, so there are other ways this is being done. Um, they're successfully doing it, but has not um, said it's not correct. And they actually provided, um, they, they were at a conference this last week with us as well at uh, the National Housing Conference. And HUD was there um, listening to our round table um, and did not object to any of the um, pre residency preference discussion. They understand it happens. Um, they don't have a way to track it and HUD does not approve them. So like you do not have to go ask HUD for residency preference, which is why they don't know exactly which jurisdictions use a residency preference because they do not approve the use of them. Okay, thank you. Um, and do we know how many applicants are from outside of Dubuque, say in the last year? Um, I can't give you a number for the last year. The last couple of months we've had, um, it's been about a 60-40 uh, split. So 60% from in Dubuque and 40% from outside of Dubuque. Um, it fluctuates based on just a lot of different things. Um, when other PHAs have open wait lists, we have fewer applicants from outside our jurisdiction, et cetera. Um, but we could run those numbers for a full year if uh, that's important. And then with the number of units that we are increasing, is there a specific number of voucher units that you anticipate we need to have in the next year to meet the need? Uh, we, we're pulling 150 applicants every month to lease up and about 85 of them to maybe about 100 will successfully get a voucher in their hand. And so that's 100 a month. So right now, uh, more than we could possibly build in this time frame of this year that we need. Um, however, the 90 going up, if we can get 90 in on one of those uh, units behind Blaine's, uh, get several of those into Housing Choice Vouchers, it's going to make a bigger dent in um, supplying some of that housing. Okay, thank you. Mr. Resnick. Thank you very much. I just wanted to point out that um, Cedar Rapids, uh, the racial uh, demographics are 80% uh, white, black, 8.6% Hispanic, 4.4. Um, our demographic information in Dubuque is not, is not that, right? So it's, it's, it's very different. Um, so I'd be very interested um, and uh, she mentioned that, uh, uh, Ms. Steger mentioned that uh, HUD does not approve uh, this, does not approve or evidently doesn't dispro disapprove or, uh, of this either. But uh, the information that we have from the city manager and the city attorney tonight imply that HUD may possibly approve the resident preference, but that's not correct because I, now I just got that information. So uh, they may possibly ignore this. I guess we'll we'll put it at that, and but it is it is precisely what we were uh, dinged for last time that that if we stick with the resident preference, then we have a 97 percent chance that the person getting uh, the uh, uh, the benefit will be a white person, and uh, that was that was not good. Uh, they said, "Oh, how could you think that you could possibly do that with those?" demographics. We need to be open uh, and maybe maybe because Cedar Rapids is closer to the national demographics uh, that no one has said anything. Uh, but I hate to see, I hate to have this wait and see. We've been trying to work with HUD for so long and they have not approved this. There it is. Uh, there was a suggestion perhaps uh, from Ms. Steger to changing the one word from pursuing to exploring. Uh, uh, that possibility of, of using that um, 
Uh, I'm back to the uh, exploring the implementation of a re residency preference. Uh, and then it's mentioned that we do this every year. And then, uh, I don't know, Ms. Steger, you may comment on this if you wish. Uh, if it's, uh, since you said they don't approve this, maybe there is no possibility if we waited a year that they would comment on this in an approving way or not. Uh, I'll, I'll ask, is there a possibility? Thank you. Um, Alexis Steger, uh, I don't, so they gave us a letter saying they will never approve or disapprove, so they just won't do it. Um, so we do know they are not going to do it in the future, affirmatively or not affirmatively. Um, one thing that will change in the next couple of months is HUD has announced that they're coming for an audit of Section 8 in June for City of Dubuque. So, um, you know, we'll get a lot of technical assistance before that as well. So in the next three or four months, these conversations about residency preference can continue to be had with more and more and more information because we're just going to have all those HUD people on site in Dubuque. So, um, you know, like as you said, we'll have all that information for next year's PHA plan as well as we continue to explore. And thank you. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't question anybody's uh, uh, idea here. They, everybody on this table, everybody who's come to us to talk, want the best for our citizens. I, I know that. And HUD is making it very hard on us to make a, a clear decision so that we can express that in a very clear way. So, I, you know, it doesn't help anything for me to grouse about that. But I, I, I just want to point out that uh, I appreciate everybody's viewpoint and how they vote. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm sure my council members will appreciate uh, how everybody else votes as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Wethel. If I could add one more. Mm -hmm. um, so I, too, want to commend everyone on their work. Alexis, you and um, your department are exceptional in what you do. I, I believe that. And I know you work hard at this. And so in my questioning, I do not question the merits of their work. I do not question the merits of anyone at this table or their belief in Dubuque being a welcoming community, not for a second. I work in healthcare, and a lot of my life is about liability. And I respect, obviously, the lawyer at the table and the advisement that you've provided and the guidance you've provided tonight. If we know we're coming for an audit, my perspective personally and my preference would be that we would adopt this without the preference point and that would, we would then revisit it after our audit in which we would have time to sit down directly with HUD folks come into our city to evaluate our process. And I appreciate if others don't feel that way, but in my own personal view, that's what I would prefer tonight. So I have a few, a few thoughts after this, and I appreciate the discussion very much. Thank you. Um, and kicked off by community members, so thank you very much for that, too. Um, the first thing that, that comes to mind here is that we, we must not oversimplify this discussion. It, it, is, it is absolutely as complicated as it sounds, and there are a lot of reasons for that. The, the housing situation in the United States has become atrocious for a lot of reasons. And a lot of them did not start here in Dubuque. There are so many complicating factors that are piled on top of years and years of housing policy and people doing things right, people doing things wrong, people with good and bad intentions. It is incredibly complicated. So as we have this discussion, I, I hope we recognize that because I think it's really easy to oversimplify this and just point at each other and say, you're the problem, or you're the one doing this wrong, or you are racist. There are a lot of different things that, that we need to think about. So what I would hope we do, first and foremost as a community, is recognize our allies and the people who are working hard to be allies in this discussion. I, I heard Mr. LeJudas in particular say that you sit with the Housing and Community Development Department on a regular basis to have these discussions. And I, and I so appreciate the fact that that occurs. And I know that occurs with landlords and developers and all kinds of different groups of people with, with city staff. Those are really important discussions. We will get nowhere by simply 
looking at each other and pointing and saying that you are the problem. We have to work together. We have to sit at the table and work together. So I, I sincerely appreciate those of us that are in, involved in this discussion because this is a incredibly sticky problem. As much as I would love to hold off on something and expect that when HUD comes for an audit, they are going to give us some clean answers about how to move forward, I just don't think that's gonna be happening. And the reason is, um, as much as HUD is working hard to be a very good department at the federal level and help with housing, they themselves are a very complicated department. It's incredibly large, there's a lot of challenges there. Um, we heard very directly from Alexis tonight that they're not gonna give us an answer on this. We're, we're kind of, we're innovating is what we're doing. And that's part of the challenge here is that we're doing something that is, we're trying to change something to try and solve a problem. And that doesn't fit easily into the parameters that are currently set in the clean box that HUD has to work with. So here's, I, I wrote a list of the things that I'm thinking that we are doing and then um, I'll, I'll see if anybody has any final words before we, we head off to a vote here. We are trying hard to incentivize development. We recognize that there is a problem with the not enough, not enough uh, units in this community. So we're working hard to try and incentivize those. Um, we set that as a goal in August. I think it was September or October that the city brought us, or the city staff brought us um, some incentive ideas to be able to move forward. We voted on those and said, let's do it. We started to work on that. So we're trying to incentivize. We're constantly looking for ways to incentivize or require the acceptance of housing choice vouchers given the, the limitations on us as a city um, government versus a state government. Um, and then we also are trying to incentivize development um, for, low in, for people who are of low income, people who need that type of housing. Uh, we are looking for ways to keep federal funding for housing. That's what this is all about. This, this idea of preference has to do with the fact that we are losing federal fun funding for this and we need to keep it. And we're constantly listening, collaborating, and looking for new ideas. I appreciate these new ideas. I think we need to keep them coming. I'm not ready to walk away from this preference idea. Uh, Alexis and her staff would not have brought this to us if they were not at the point of, uh, and I don't wanna say desperate because that's a little bit too strong, but you get where I'm going here. That's an idea that we, we all recognize that, um, somebody said we were dinged for it. We recognize that. What the plan that we received and that we voted for is not the same plan that we were dinged for 10 years ago. It's not. And I respect the fact that they brought that forward to us in a way to innovate this and try to save the vouchers that we have because we are losing them. We have to keep them. It's, it's to solve the problem. It's not to cause another one. It's to solve it. So I'm, I'm ready to vote for this as is. I, I don't want to change any wording. I don't want to move forward differently. I, I don't want to hold off on anything. Um, I, I do trust uh, the Housing and Community Development Department staff and the rest of the city staff to move forward in a direction that's going to be responsible with this because they've described it in detail to us. And I think that it's, when we get an audit from HUD in June, it's gonna be with the collaboration of our staff, it's gonna be working hard to try and figure out how we can fix these challenges. So I plan to vote for this as it is. So um, that's, that's where I'm standing on this. So last quick words and we can move on here, Ms. Farber. Yes, um, so I uh, very much appreciate your points about problem solving. And then I would extend that problem solving um, uh, request, if you will, to everybody here tonight to help us lease up. In other words, to find those people that are low income or struggling where they currently are living and get the word out that we have vouchers available for them to lease up. Because I think a lot of that might just be a communication problem or um, reticence on their part because they just don't know which way to turn, just like on the low utilities, you know, how we can uh, pay for utilities for those in low income. So I think it's a combination of all of us trying to problem solve here in the short term and in the longer term. And um, I agree with um, what was said previously here where you, let's get some more data points. Let's hear or not hear from HUD based on their audit. I think that's important data point as well. Uh, and then we should move forward accordingly. So I will support this as well, and I will look forward to our next phase and our next steps according to uh, what the information and the data comes back at us. But I, I do uh, want uh, just to reach out uh, to everyone to help us get these people to uh, who are uh, needing it to, to lease up uh, in that respect. So thank you very much. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I, I guess I'd just remind everyone, including myself, that this and everything that we do is a work in progress and that if there's a wrong turn, we'll correct it. If there's a misstep, we'll correct it. 
And if we're on the right path, we'll, we'll work hard to stay there. And we're working real, real hard to get there um, every day. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess looking at what Alexis said, regardless, we are still short units. Um, we've got 90 coming online sometime this year. Um, but she had also mentioned that between 80 to 100 of the vouchers we need a, a month. So if you just do some quick math there, uh, 12 times 100 is 1,200 minus the 90 that are coming online. We're still short over 1,000 units. And even if it's 80 people coming on needing vouchers, 80 times 12 is 960 minus 90 is 870. So we're still short between 800 and, 1, 000, and over 1,000 units. So we've got, of course, a lot of work to do. So we can get all the folks that we want on the program if we don't have a place for them to live is the big thing. So I'm... I like the idea of this. I really want to see the numbers next year. And then if we don't, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. And of course, if how's, I guess my last question to Krenna is, are we able to amend our, in this, amend our, this, this paperwork in say July? So Alexis, help me out here. But since this is the annual plan, this is done once a year. And the admin plan is where we have more flexibility and fluidity to amend throughout the year. That's correct. Okay. All right. Okay. So we sounds like we can possibly change this if we need to. It, so so the an, so this one is the annual plan. It's kind yes. of the governing document for the year. The admin plan is where you have more control over the day-to-day -day implementation and operation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Rezek. Thank you. Just for clarification, uh, and Ms. Steger, if you could help me. Uh, my memory of, of the workshop, uh, work session that we had, was that uh, we really have twice as many units as are being used right now. So we have many units, a, th a thousand, that are not being used that are, are accepting the Housing Choice vouchers. Uh, they're just not being chosen to be used by those who have the vouchers. Um, so what is exactly is the situation? Alexis Steiger. So we uh, collect with the rental license applications every year if a uh, rental unit would accept housing choice vouchers. So that's the number you're referring to is that we do have uh, landlords that say they're willing to accept vouchers, um, but they would have to be vacant units, you know, to be able to accept a voucher. So um, that's where the disconnect happens is they just, we just have a very low vacancy rate. And then when you do look at what becomes vacant, only 33% of those that come vacant are accepting a voucher. Um, and that's if the right 33% are coming vacant. So that's what you're referring to. Um, yeah, we, we just have also a low vacancy rate. So not only is it only 33% of landlords accepting housing choice vouchers, but it's also a low vacancy rate. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Okay. The motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Motion made by Resnick, uh, seconded by Roussel. So I believe we've had a good chance to discuss this. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Resnick? No. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Motion passes five to two. Public hearing number two is resolution of approval for the proposed amended and restated urban renewal plan for the greater downtown urban renewal district version 2023.1. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick. I move to receive it and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt the resolution approving the amended and restated urban renewal plan version 2023.1 for the greater downtown urban renewal district. The proposed amended and restated urban renewal plan would add a project to the public purpose activities specifically low-income small business grants. I concur with the recommendation and respect for the request, Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council adopt a resolution approving the amended and restated urban renewal plan version 2023.1 for the Greater Downtown Urban Renewal District. Do we have anyone in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one here, do we have any virtual input? Virtual comments. Thank you. And no input received. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. Seeing none, 
Got a motion by Resnick, second by Farber to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number three is public hearing for sale of city owned property at 612 Lincoln Avenue. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. A motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Motion by Sprank, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan, Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council hold a public hearing and authorize the Mayor to execute the purchase agreement for 612 Lincoln Avenue as presented. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council approval of a resolution disposing of city-owned real property located at 612 Lincoln Avenue and authorizing the mayor to execute the purchase agreement as presented. Uh, anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, do we have any virtual input? No virtual input. Thank you. No input received. Thank you. Back to the table then for any discussion. Yeah, Mr. Spring. Well, I just hope, I just want to say that hopefully this sells so we can have some new neighbors in my neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Seeing none, the motion is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. That's a 7 0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address when the Mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the Mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public input this evening? Hello, my name is Jim Gantz, uh, 12241 Forest Meadow Drive in Dubuque. Um, I'm here today to bring to your attention that I have a development plan um, in the works with the City of Dubuque. The development plan is called um, Union Park Place uh, Town Apartments and Townhomes. It's for 152 uh, units of, um, uh, there's uh, 13 eightplex townhomes and six uh, eightplex apartment buildings. Uh, the location is, um, well, it's actually directly north of the Switch Homes development, which, you know, the uh, council has approved uh, recently. Um, the property that, uh, that I'm developing, uh, as well as the property that Switch Homes developing, was owned by my family, all of it. It uh, was approximately 450 acres um, on the north end of town. And uh, when the Northwest Ontario was completed from JFK down to Central Avenue, uh, the uh, DOT did an entire take because they were splitting our farm up. So when the time came to uh, offer back the excess, it was offered back to us. Um, I personally purchased the 43 acres on the north side and my family purchased the 83 acres, which was eventually sold to switch homes on the south side. Uh, at the time that we, uh, we, that we purchased the property from the DOT, we were granted access to the Northwest Arterial. Uh, the purpose of our purchasing it back was for development, uh, both on the north side and the south side. We were granted uh, direct access to the Northwest Arterial in conjunction with our purchase. Um, so we purchased development property. Um, we decided not to do the south side. There's too many family members, but um, I d still desire to develop the north side uh, because I own that myself. Uh, so my, my plan actually, my development plan, conceptual plan, actually is on the agenda for the uh, uh, zoning advisory committee meeting on Wednesday. Um, but staff report 
uh, indicates that the recommendation is to table my development. So my purpose to, to, uh, here is I want you people to know that my development plan is out there. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, this whole process, my development plan has taken forever. I have been trying to get together with the city uh, uh, since September. Couldn't get on their calendar. Finally had to seek the services of Mike Van Milligan to get a, uh, a meeting even scheduled. So I don't know why these delays have been taking place. I suspect, I have a good suspicion why they're taking place. I think it has a lot to do with the, the access is very controversial. Um, it's, it's very clear that there's a, um, um, a feeling out there that uh, we don't want any more intersections on the Northwest Arterial. My plan doesn't work without an, interse uh, an intersection on the Northwest Arterial. There's no other way for me to access my uh, property. Furthermore, I do have a legal access right for my property. So. Uh, at the same time that I'm trying to get my development plan approved, Switch Homes, is uh, their plan is way ad in advance of mine. Their, their final plan is going to come before you probably at the next meeting. Okay, And the concern there is that the access that's proposed for Switch Homes is going to be, if you approve the access that's... Um, currently been approved on the preliminary plat, on the final plat, on their final plat, uh, that will make my um, uh, development uh, impossible. Um, because there is calling for a right in, right out only access, all right? Uh, and my, the access, the, 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 uh, the legal access, they were out, uh, across from one another originally, but then for whatever reason, switch homes, move theirs, 500 foot west, so now, you know, theirs is a right in, right out, 500 foot west of, of mine, and I mean, it makes no sense. If the only thing that makes sense, the only way my property can be developed is with full access, okay? Granted, switch homes can do it without, you know, the full access there, but, uh, you know, it, it, it makes no sense. The, the only access for my property that makes sense and for the other switch homes as well as the 120 acres to the east of it uh, makes sense is if it's a full access across from one another. You know, it, it, they can't be staggered. So, so that's, I just wa wanted to bring it to your attention so that when switch homes, final plat comes before you, you ask the question, what about this development that Mr. Gantz is trying to do? You know, doesn't he have the right to develop his property as well? Switch Homes is 105 uh, single family units. Mine's 152 workforce uh, units. So that's, that's, all I, that's all I ask is please ask the question when that final plaque comes before you. So, you know, you may ask, well, what, what the, uh, my plan is being tabled because the city needs further information. Well, you know, one of them is sanitary sewer. I, I talked to uh, uh, Gus Sahoyas. He said they're working on that. But the big one is the access. That's the access. So it's going to boil down to the question, okay, what do you prefer? Do you want more housing units or do you want to not provide, uh, not uh, approve another access on that northwest arterial. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions on me? We actually aren't allowed to ask questions at this point, but thank oh, you very okay. much, Mr. Gantz. We right, appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public input this evening? Seeing no one here, do we have any virtual input? No virtual okay. input. And no input received. Okay. Last call. All right. Moving on to action items then. Thank you. Action item number one is subdivision development agreement for a portion of Asbury Plaza subdivision along Plaza Drive to be known as Asbury Plaza number 22. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Motion by Roussel, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. 
City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council approval of the subdivision development agreement with Talon LLC, a South Dakota limited liability company also known as Talon Development, Eagle Construction Incorporated, a South Dakota corporation, and Fox Hills Apartments LLC, a South Dakota limited liability company, for construction of public improvements along a portion of Plaza Drive in the city of Dubuque to be known as Asbury Plaza Number 22 in the city of Dubuque through the adoption of the enclosed resolution. In 2006, the prior property owner and developer of this area along Plaza Drive installed streets and storm sewer, sanitary sewer, and water main utility improvements at the site. The previously installed streets and utilities were never accepted by the city, except for the water main utility improvements. The owner, developer, and contractor, collectively called the project team, planned to complete the remaining public improvement work and dedicate the improvements to the city for ownership and maintenance. A subdivision development agreement has been prepared to set forth the terms and conditions for the construction of the improvements, dedication of the improvements, dedication of right-of-way and easements, and providing for the warranty guarantees on the dedicated public improvements. As part of the proposed Fox Hills residential subdivision that includes 13 30-unit apartment buildings, the developer plans to construct and provide at their cost subdivision improvements. City staff has reviewed and approved the design and construction plans and has reviewed and approved the dedication of right-of-way and easement plats for set improvements as required by the subdivision development agreement. The project team plans to begin work on the project in May of 2023. The project will be completed substantially by August 1st, 2024, and that's this phase. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Seeing none. Okay. Motion is to uh, receive and file and adopt this resolution. A motion by Roussel, second by Wethel. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is work session request, flock safety automated license plate reader presentation. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that the council uh, schedule a work session for 515 Monday, May 15th um, to look at uh, license plate readers. Second. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. And that works for everybody. I just want to say thank you uh, to Mike and, and uh, the chief of police for putting this on there so quickly. Um, we talked about it already just let, a couple weeks ago at our budget hearing, and this is something that comes pretty quickly. And I also saw that you extended the time so we could talk about it a little bit more. So thank you for that. Mr. Mayor, I'd also remind you that May 1st, you have another work session to review the city security camera system. And that one it follows this work session, correct? Uh, so prior, to, so this prior one's to May 15th, so isn't it May 1st? Oh, right, sorry, I, yeah. yeah, sorry. I see yeah. what you're saying, yes, earlier in the month, yeah, absolutely, right. yep, thank you. Okay, motion by Jones, second by Resnick. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Barber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number three is right size your trash cart video. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and watch the video. Second. And a motion by Roussel, second by Farber. It's video time. Right sizing your cart today will ensure you receive the tipper cart that best suits your needs when it becomes available. The City of Dubuque offers four cart sizes at four price points. Options include a 35 gallon cart, the standard size and base price for waste collection, 48 gallon cart, 64 gallon cart, and a 96 gallon cart. Unless a larger cart size is requested, those that currently subscribe to basic service will receive a 35 gallon cart. As carts increase in size, so do subscription fees. While carts larger than 35 gallons cost a bit more per month, it's important you right size your cart by requesting the appropriate size for how much trash you normally produce weekly. And remember, the more you recycle, the less trash you have to throw out. If you find that you often overstuff your container or use green excess trash stickers frequently, then it's probably time to consider a larger cart. 
To request a cart size larger than 35 gallons, visit cityofdubuque.org slash trash collection or call 563-589-4250. Excellent work. I really appreciate the Public Works Department for getting so much uh, the word out on this because um, it's a lot of education required, so thank you very much. All right, well, motion by Roussel, second by Farmer to watch that video. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Next, our council member reports. All right, well, I'll kick us off for this one because we were all together in Washington, D.C., actually, last week. And I, I just have to say, um, first of all, thank you to everyone who was able to join us there. Uh, but then also, um, I, I just want to say I, I was proud to be a member of a city council that shows up like that. I really was. Uh, it, it, makes, it makes a difference. It takes some time. <laughs> it definitely takes some time to make that difference. But those relationships that we form in doing this uh, are incredibly important. And when you have an entire city council that shows up, spends the entire day together um, being really sprinted from one department to the next by one Terry Goodman, um, we, we really get a lot done. And we made some great contacts. And I think um, you know, we're able to talk about some really important issues, um, issues that everyone knows about because we've talked about them here publicly, um, every single one. So um, all the same things that we're talking about in budgeting and our goal setting, you know, this is how we, we get this done and make those federal partnerships. So thank you to everyone for that. And uh, I think it was a very productive week. Yeah. Ms. Farber. Mr. Mayor, just uh, to tag with that, I was um, fortunate to attend the National League of Cities um, uh, IT Advocacy Committee meeting, which ran for two and a half days, starting on that Saturday before mm -hmm. uh, our other meetings. And it was... Uh, just a wonderful opportunity to learn more about broadband access uh, and what the FCC and the NTIA could offer um, cities of our size and throughout the United States with the funding that's forthcoming. And I wanted to give a shout out to Chris Coleman, who was unable to join us. Um, so uh, at the last minute before we were meeting with the NTIA uh, and I was her pinch hitter, she had sent me um, a very, very long and descriptive email as to some of the points that we had discussed at the conference, but wanted to get just more detail as to the implementation of implementation as to what we were doing here so I could have case and comment for the NTIA. Uh, and I think hopefully I uh, was able to represent her well and the city well, uh, being uh, hopefully uh, giving some more, uh, if you will, input as to what we could potentially uh, garner back for um, broadband access for low income um, subsidies, if you will, beginning at $30 per household, uh, et cetera. So I just wanted to, to thank her and also to thank, thank Terry Goodman for all that she did. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Jones, I saw you getting ready there, and then Mr. Resnick will come back. Oh, to you. It was a pretty incredible couple of days, uh, busy, busy, busy um, as could be. Um, just want to let you know that. Uh, Mr. Resnick, Ms. Wethel, and I had an opportunity to visit with uh, Congresswoman Henson at O'Hare. Just a happenstance meeting. We spent about 20 minutes uh, piling on, <laughs> no, just, just adding to the conversation. And, and uh, um, again, I had the opportunity to thank all of our federal representatives for sending their staffs here for the second half of this thing in August every year because we get a chance for them to get their, their hands and eyes on the projects that are, that are mattering to us. And, the things that they've helped us with, the things that remain challenges, and uh, the things that uh, that remain dreams, and, and uh, try and get our heads around them all. So that that's that's just really a good thing. Um, overall, it was uh, as educational for each of us as it was, I think, for for each of the folks that we met with. And uh, I have to commend the the chamber for their part, which is day two. They made it a regional event. They they brought in representatives of the state of Wisconsin, the state of Illinois, and everything that that uh, they do impacts us and everything that we do impacts them as well. So that was, that was really a brilliant move and uh, added a lot of value, I think, to the day. Yeah. Thank you for reminding us all that uh, the chamber was a huge part of this. Chamber was a, a big partner in all that too, so thank you. Okay. Ms. Wethel, I'm sorry, Mr. Resnick, and then Ms. Wethel. I, I said I was coming back to you, forgot. 
That's all right. Thank you. And, and again, we're on the same topic. And I wanted to mention how uh, you, you were, Mr. Mayor, proud of the city council for showing up. You know, we were all, all of us, were proud of our city staff and how they helped, especially that first day talking um, uh, and they're competent and, and, and enthusiastic, knew their stuff and knew what to do, uh, how to make any appropriations, uh, make the most difference here in Dubuque. And I, second, I would uh, like to um, uh, thank the members of Congress and their staff because uh, when they were talking to us without the cameras on, they really seemed to w want to work through the, you know, through those political differences that people are always throwing up as barriers and seem to say, well, what, what can we do to make things better for the citizens in the Dubuque area? Uh, and so I was, I was very impressed by that. I appreciate uh, everybody, uh, my travel buddies, and, and those people who are uh, helping us along the way. Uh, it, uh, travel is no glamorous situation. And uh, Mr. Mayor, you're there longer than everybody else. It gets to be a grind, but I, uh, we were focused on what we can do to make Dubuque a better city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Ms. Wethel. Just to piggyback on a compliment to city staff, while we were at the EPA, we actually received um, notification that the planning for sustainable brownfield redevelopment uh, was put out to uh, the nation is actually an example of how the EPA works together with a municipality. That's amazing. And so they showcased our ball field site and kudos to all of the city staff. What a remarkable compliment to them that that is put out into our nation as an example of how the EPA gets work done with a municipality. Fantastic addition. I feel like we could talk about this for quite a bit longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, any other council members? Yeah, yes. Mr. Jones. Um, I think a number of us received a, an unsolicited gift in the mail this week. Um, Pretty nice book um, highlighting the, the life of uh, Ted Ellsworth, former Iowa State representative, a World War II hero by any measure. And uh, it, it was a lobbying effort. He's one of the, his name is one of the names in consideration for renaming a park. Um, but I wanted to let the, I would have sent it back, but there was no return address on the, on the package. I want to thank the Ellsworth family for, for sending it. It was very considerate. I've passed mine on to, to Nick Rossman from Carnegie Style Public Library. And I suspect there'll be other copies of it there. And if you want to know about this incredible man, go check it out. Um, it'll be there. Um, so thank you for that. It was a kind gesture. One we can't accept under the laws uh, that we agreed to and, and the rules that we agreed to when we take these jobs. But thank you for that to that family. Mr. Jones. The only addition I would have is, is just, I'm, I'm just going to say one more thing. And um, it's just for the sake of being able to say it out loud and hope that some people are still listening. Um, but, you know, we had some really severe weather come through on Friday, and I just want to thank our city staff. Um, you know, we had, I, I believe, every single firefighter that was on duty was, um, had responded to that. The police department, public works, a lot of people were busy. Um, we were spared some of the worst of it. Uh, some of our neighbors to the south and other neighbors were um, hit pretty hard. There's another round coming tomorrow night, and I, I guess, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people saying lately, did we always freak out about the weather like this? I remember when I was a kid, the weather wasn't this bad. Well. The science has gotten better. <laughs> we, the, you know, what I, what we get for weather reports from the city manager who shares them, and um, you know, the emergency response team, uh, that stuff is based on the science that is there for us to look at. And you know, sometimes the weather misses us, but sometimes it doesn't. So I do hope that people take it seriously. Um, this is the time of year that we see tornadoes. We've seen a lot of devastation all over the country. So I hope that people are are taking that seriously and uh, just keep your eyes to the sky tomorrow night because we could have some more challenges ahead of us. So hopefully not too many more, but we could. Mr. Mayor, yeah, Mr. if I Jones. could just add just, just a titch to that. You talked about the science being better. Um, the warning technology is a lot better. Um, I had a couple of people ask me, why didn't the sirens go off for that when we first went under a tornado warning? Well, we didn't. Portions of the county did. Mm -hmm. And it used to be the whole county or not. Um, frankly, in the middle of the night, it's going to be the whole county or not because spotters are less effective unless there's a whole lot of lightning to see the storms. Um, but by day anyway, when we've got our spotter network out, and uh, the Weather Service is doing the, the great precision job that they're able to do now, um, a warning may or may not include an entire county. And because of the, 
the desire not to cry wolf, sirens aren't necessarily activated until it affects us. Now that said, it doesn't have to be a tornado to cause a siren activation. If, uh, if we've got reports of straight line winds that are knocking down buildings in Epworth, um, Dubuque's gonna create its own warning. Um, and it's not a tornado warning per se, but it might as well be because your life is in danger. So if you hear sirens, get inside, take cover. Um, I know in, in the Midwest, the thing to do is go outside with your camera and see what, what you can see. And if you're gonna do that, for God's sake, look around. If you see a tornado, especially if you see one that doesn't look like it's moving, chances are it's coming right at you. Um, take cover, be safe. Um, it's nothing to mess with. And, and one of the reasons too is that storms are in fact more severe than they were, more severe and more frequent than they were 20 years ago or 10 years ago or even five years ago. So uh, hopefully we won't have to duck and cover tomorrow, but if we do, please do. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Well, we do have a closed session. Mr. Jones. I move that the council go into closed session in accordance with chapter 24.5. 21.5. 21.4. 21.4. Yeah. Why do I not know that, having made this motion 100 <laughs> times in the last 17 years? Um, second. To discuss pending real estate transactions. I heard the second from Ms. Roussel. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Uh, if you just want to state for the record, the attorney will be. Oh, I'm sorry. Present. Thank you very much for stopping yeah, me there. Yeah. Sorry. For the record, the attorney <laughs> the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in closed session is city attorney Krenner Bomwell. I had it sitting right here in front of me. Thank you. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Jones? Aye. 7-0. We are in closed session.